He's the Robin Hood of the New World. Aristocrat by day, protector of the oppressed by night. He causes a scandal, the like of which had never been seen before. He's the stuff of great fiction, films and TV. An adventurer with a daring alter ego. A swashbuckling lover, always able to escape his enemies with skill and style, leaving nothing but his mark, a Z. But is it possible that behind the mask of fiction lies a real historical figure? Some academics now think so. They believe Zorro's inspiration is not from America. He's not from Mexico. He's not even from Spain. Examining the personal papers of the legendary figure, revealing documents from his trial in Mexico, and investigating a daring prison escape, we open the mystery files on Zorro. City, Christmas Day, 1650. A revolutionary figure is imprisoned by Inquisition judges. He climbs out of his cell, breaks through heavy doors, and spirits over the prison walls to freedom. Overnight, the man spreads pamphlets throughout the city, declaring the judicial system is corrupt. The shadowy figure leaves no other trace behind. Rumours began to circulate in the city that his escape had somehow been supernatural. Could this man's exploits be the basis for one of the most famous heroes in fiction? Zorro. Zorro was created by American writer Johnston McCulley in 1919. The first Zorro book, The Curse of Capistrano, introduces a character that is later made famous by Hollywood films and TV shows. But the story of Zorro might not be entirely fiction. Professor Fabio Troncarelli is an Italian academic who has studied the works of Johnston Macaulay. Macaulay wrote a lot of books with characters with a double identity. They are men uh, different day and night. Macaulay may have based Zorro on outlaws who operated in California during the gold rush. Others believe Macaulay might have taken his inspiration from Robin Hood. Troncarelli has his own theory. In America, at the time, there was a great interest about Mexican history because of the Mexican Revolution. One Mexican writer who could have captured Macaulay's imagination is Riva Palacio. 1872, Mexico City. Palacio authors many literary and historical works and writes for several newspapers. He was an intellectual, a politician, a writer, historian. His books are adventure stories. But Troncarelli's investigations reveal that Palacio's books are not just fiction. Troncarelli has come to the National Archives in Madrid, Spain. He believes that Palacio's source materials are real historical accounts from 200 years earlier, when Mexico is a colony of Spain. In 17th century Mexico, the most feared and respected institution is the Inquisition. It kept meticulous records of its investigations. Frank Asa Beloso is a historian who has studied Riva Palacio's writing. He spent significant amount of time going through the documents and the archives, and he had a fascination with the records kept by the Inquisition. He started writing true stories on true lives, true crimes. One of the characters recorded in the archives is Guillén Lombardo. The accounts state that Lombardo traveled to Mexico in 1640. He was later arrested and put on trial by the Inquisition and they reveal an intriguing detail about Lombardo's life. He is not Mexican or even Spanish. He is Irish. And his real name is William Lamport. Riva Palacio found 
uh, uh, Lamport's trial and then created a novel based on the document. In Palacio's book on Lamport, there is a chapter called Zorro y Lobo, the wolf and the fox. In another Palacios novel, there is a character called El Zorro. In New York in 1908, accounts of the Spanish Inquisition were published by Henry Charles Lee. Lee used some of Palacios' documents as source material, including Lamport's story. Lee may have had a connection to Macaulay, the creator of Zorro. Writer Gerard Ronan is tracing the roots of Lamport's real-life exploits. William Lamport may have been an influence on Macaulay's novel of Don Diego de la Vega, otherwise known as Zorro. William Lamport is born in rural Wexford Island in 1615. Following the death of his mother, as a boy, Lamport is sent to college in Dublin and eventually to London, England. His tutors had identified him as something of a prodigy. He became a difficult child. That he was intelligent was beyond no doubt. But in England, it is a time of great religious conflict. As a Catholic, Lamport faces persecution from the Protestant authorities. While leaving the country on a ship, a chance event would change the course of Lamport's life. It would appear that the ship was taken by pirates, so he had little choice but to join the pirate crew. For the next couple of years, William is a member of a pirate ship. It is a harsh education. After two years on the high seas, Lamport jumps ship and makes his way to northern Spain. Spain in the 17th century rules over a global empire that spreads from Europe to the new world of the Americas. Philip IV is king. He reigns over a country that is sympathetic to the Catholic Irish. Bright and enterprising, Lamport offers his services to a local governor who introduces him to the influential politician, the Count Duke of Olivares. Olivares is the power behind the throne in Spain. Really, who runs the Spanish monarchy is the Count Duke of Olivares. By the late 1630s, he has what's uh, practically absolute control of the monarchy. He moves to Madrid, the center of power of the Spanish Empire, and takes on missions for Olivares. His work for Olivares was mainly in the role of propagandist and a glorified messenger boy. He appears at one stage to have run a secret errand for the king himself. Proving himself to be a loyal servant to Spain, Lamport translates his name to the Spanish form from William Lamport to Guillen Lombardo. Fabio Troncarelli retraces Lamport's footsteps at the Colegio San Isidro, Madrid, where the Irishman studied. In Madrid high society, Lamport was considered intelligent, clever. He would have studied mathematics, geometry, astrology, astronomy, you name it, he was studying it. But events elsewhere in the Spanish Empire would soon propel Lamport into legend. 1640, New Spain. Modern-day Mexico is one of Spain's most treasured colonies. Run by a Spanish viceroy, Spain's control over the distant colony is precarious. There are tensions between the indigenous population of Indians and the Spanish settlers. For the Duke of Olivares in Madrid, the stakes are high. There's a constant fear that there will be uprisings that then Viceroy writes repeatedly to Madrid saying, I think Mexico is going out of control. We need to do something. Olivares orders a mission to bring Mexico back under Spain's control. Lamport is sent on the mission as a spy. Lamport is supposed to travel to Mexico in the company of the new Viceroy on its ship in all secrecy as if he was just any other passenger. And he is to report back on the performance of the new Viceroy. After 10 years in Spain, Lamport now arrives in Mexico City. 
Mexico City during the first half of the 17th century is a, a very cosmopolitan city. I mean, there's people from all the different areas of uh, the huge Spanish empire living in the city. Lamport begins to observe the ruling elite. He discovers a divided society. You have virtually two separate states. I mean, with different sets of rules, of laws, of institutions for the Spaniards and for the Indians. Lamport sends reports to Madrid about the society he finds. And it's here that Troncarelli believes that Lamport's Zorro-like comparisons really begin. In Johnston McCulley's first ever Zorro book, the hero is an aristocrat who poses as an incompetent swordsman. But he has a dramatic alter ego in the form of Zorro. Lamport was shocked by what he sees in Mexico. 